Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll take a few minutes to wait for everyone to sign in and then we'll get started shortly. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Jane Finley, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. I'd like to take the time to acknowledge that the UBC Vancouver Point Grey Campus is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Well, our Okanagan campus is situated on the traditional and ancestral unceded territory of the Silks Okanagan people. I would also like to acknowledge that uh, you are probably joining us from many different places near and far and would ask you to quietly acknowledge to yourself the traditional owners and caretakers um, of those lands. Now we are meeting today through a Zoom webinar. And with that comes modified features from what you might be familiar with in using Zoom. You'll notice on the bottom ribbon of your, your screen that there are a few options. You can use the chat to communicate with our back end team should you experience any technical issues. And you can use the Q&A feature to share questions and to upvote those that you'd like to see the panelists address in the Q&A portion of the event. And now I'd like to introduce President and Vice Chancellor Santa Ono. Santa Ono is the 15th President and Vice Chancellor of the University of British Columbia. He also serves as Chair of the U15 Group of Universities on the Board of Directors of Universities Canada and as a past Chair of Research Universities of British Columbia. In 2018, he served as Co-Chair of the Tri-Council Advisory Committee on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Policy. Prior to his appointment as president and vice chancellor of UBC, Dr. Ono served as the 28th president of the University of Cincinnati and senior vice provost and deputy to the provost at Emory University. A molecular immunologist educated at the University of Chicago and McGill, Dr. Ono has taught at John Hopkins, Harvard University and University College London. He holds honorary doctorates from Chiba University and the Vancouver School of Theology and is a recipient of the Reginald Wilson Diversity Leadership Award from the American Council on Ed Education, the Professional Achievement Award from the University of Chicago, a Grand Challenges Hero Award from UCLA, and the NAAAP 100 Award from the National Association of Asian American Professionals. Thank you very much for joining us and over to you, President Ono. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah Jane, and I'm very excited that there are about 125 people here today at this uh, leadership forum, which is, I think, a record. Welcome, everybody, to this third leadership forum. It's a forum that's very close to my heart, as you can tell from the, the biographical sketch that was just read. We'll be focusing on anti-racism, something which uh, it's been a passion of mine for quite some time. In June, I committed UBC to some significant work on anti-racism. I'm very, very pleased to say that we've been hard at work for several months, particularly anti-Black racism. And this uh, follows on the heel of our announcement just a couple of weeks ago on our exciting Indigenous strategic plan, which is really uh, a top priority of the institution. This forum will help us to develop some shared language as a university and literacy about how we will advance these commitments over the next few years. And we hope that it will have a lasting impact on this institution and hopefully beyond that. In an in the introduction to the groundbreaking book uh, in 2017, The Equity Myth, the authors, several of whom are with us today, write in that, that the university is a racialized site that still excludes and marginalizes non-white people, sometimes in subtle, sometimes in overt ways, it's complex, sophisticated, and ironic ways, from everyday interactions with colleagues to institutional practices that are 
at best uh, are ineffective and at worst perpetuate structural racism. And as you know, I've been speaking with hundreds of members of our university community about their experiences. And I can say that the stories are both shocking and, and, and sobering in terms of the work ahead of us. But I have every belief that working together, we can actually make significant progress uh, towards these aims. Our task today is to come to a deeper understanding of how our processes and practices and institution lead to the exclusion of black and indigenous faculty, staff and students. And to think proactively of how to make effective, significant and enduring change. It's really quite an, an opportunity for us as an institution. As our guide today, I thought long and hard about who to help moderate this conversation. And the guy today is really someone I respect enormously. Uh, she's one of the authors of The Equity Myth, Professor Melinda Smith. And many of you know her. She's really a national figure um, in, in this field. Dr. Melinda Smith is the inaugural Vice Provost Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and a professor of political science at the University of Calgary. She's a former VP Equity for the Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences and currently serves as chair of its advisory committee on EDI and decolonization. She's a co-author of The Equity Myth, Racialization and Indigeneity at Canadian Universities and a co-editor of the forthcoming Nuances of Blackness in the Canadian Academy. She's the recipient of the 2020 Susan S. Northcutt Award from the International Studies Association and a 2020 Rosalind Smith Professional Award from the National Black Coalition of Canada Edmonton and a 2018 Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Fellow. Over to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, very generous uh, introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Before I provide some opening remarks, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that the University of Calgary, from where I'm speaking, is located on traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I want to extend my profound thank yous to Dr. Santa Ono, president of the University of British Columbia, for the invitation to work with his team in putting together this uh, president uh, forum, leadership forum. I also want to uh, thank then the, the people who I've been working most closely with. Uh, those uh, in the Vice President, uh, AVP Equity and Inclusion Office, uh, those in human re in HR, though uh, the Senior Advisor on Racialized Faculty, Dr. Manel Matani, and the Senior Advisor on Indigenous Affairs. This has truly been a collective effort. And I think that effort actually is quite consistent with the view that if you want to go far, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, go together. As, from, as part of my brief remarks, I wanted to make three uh, points before I introduce the panel. The first point I want to make is that um, we are meeting together in the context of an unprecedented time, a moment of great social, economic, political, and educational disruptions. These disruptions, disruptions are shaped by a pandemic, COVID-19, which is, but it's also shaped by a pandemic within a pandemic. The resurgence of racism in its most virulent form, which is perhaps easier to recognize than the more subtle forms of racism, the systemic forms of racism, which are perpetuated by data or lack of data, and by policies and processes, and by everyday ways of uh, reproducing those practices and policies. The hidden curriculum, if you will, and the informal policies and networks that reproduce the status quo. 
So we're meeting in a context in which COVID-19 has exposed the pandemic within the pandemic. And we've seen that played out, especially for, for those who are black and has been drawn to our attention by Black Lives Matter in particular, but also the mobilization globally around the deaths of, uh, uh, of black people within the United States. I also want to stress within Canada. And it is brought to our attention by the experiences of, of indigenous peoples, persistent, and by the, the COVID, it's called COVID racism, the, experience, the, the multiple forms of anti-Asian racisms experienced by West Asians, who are Muslims, for example, experienced by East and South Asians. And it, it highlights, what this form highlights as is and amplifies is that racism is multiple, not singular, and we need to understand the nuances and the ways in which it plays out. But the other, the other point I want to make though, is that we are addressing racism in this moment. And that addressing requires us to register the fact that it's informed by a forgetting of the decades in which we, have, we ought to have been addressing racism and racial equity in Canadian universities. So I wanna briefly sketch three points before I, I introduce the panel. The first is we have had a long policy framework aimed at addressing visible or racialized minorities and advancing racial equity. Whether it's the 1950s uh, efforts to think about visible minorities as a, 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 a equity deserving group, whether it's the 1960s Bill of Rights, the 1977 Canadian Human Rights uh, Act, the 1978 Voluntary Affirmative Action Act, or the 1984 Royal Commission on Equality and Employment, which was chaired by uh, Justice Rosalie Silverman Bella, who's now in the Supreme Court. That commission in 84 was to inquire into the most effective, efficient, and equitable means of promoting employment opportunities and eliminating systemic, that word, systemic discrimination against four designated groups, women, the language then was native people, disabled persons, and visible minorities. Abella made a key point, and I quote, to ensure freedom from discrimination required government intervention. It is not a question of whether we need regulation in this area, but of whether, where and how to apply it. What is needed to achieve equality in employment is a massive policy response to systemic discrimination. It is not that individuals in these four groups are inherently unable to achieve equality on their own. It is that the obstacles in their way are so formidable and so self-perpetuating that they cannot be overcome without intervention. It is both intolerable and insensitive if we simply wait and hope that the barriers will disappear with time. Equality in employment will not happen unless it we make it happen. The purpose of that legislation, the Employment Equity Act that followed was to achieve equality in the workplace so that no person should be denied employment opportunities based on these groups other than ability. So what has happened since the 1980s, 1990s is that those four designated groups have been shrunk to one group. If we had followed Abella's judgment and the Employment Equity Act, we would have racial equity. We would have racial equity and anti-racism policies. And we will note that most, most equity offices, and I'm the a vice provost of one of them, do not have an, a, a racial equity policy, which means we have failed at least one of the designated groups. I would argue we have failed dis persons with disabilities as well. So we can talk about those intersections. So what will we require to do? I think we will see amplified in the panel today, uh, almost 20 years, 30 years on. We were supposed to adopt accountability mechanisms and have a senior person responsible for employment equity. We were supposed to communicate this to our employees He's supposed to consult and collaborate with bargaining agents and our employee representatives. In other words, the principle of not about us without us for racialized minorities of, and, and, and black, disaggregated black, South Asian, Arab, 
and so on, that principle was evident two decades ago. We were supposed to complete a workforce analysis, not of just women, a workforce analysis of four equity groups. And I would say the legislation has shifted now to five, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer. So there is no volunteerism about this. We were supposed to have disaggregated information on racialized groups and the extent to which we lag in doing this, in collecting the data on our workforce for racialized minorities, we are actually, in my view, in violation of that act. And we, are, we have no, and that it also expressed a lack of commitment to racial equity. A couple more points. The, um, you're supposed to complete a systems review for racialized minorities, create short and long-term goals for increasing, for closing gaps. You cannot close gaps without data. That means data from the point of application to shortlist, to hiring, to movement through the ranks. I cannot stress this enough because this, as a vice provost equity, this comes up repeatedly and I want to us to disabuse ourselves of any notion that we can advance racial equity within the university without good comprehensive data across the life path. So it called for adopting special measures. We, you cannot address systemic inequities without positive policies and practices and reasonable accommodation. You need a monitoring systems, make reasonable efforts to achieve these goals and objectives. And we need an employment equity plan that's reviewed repeatedly. So I wanna stop there for now to say then that we need good policies and we will see our, pre our presenters talk about it. We need good data and we need accountability mechanisms. So I want to then now turn my attention to introducing our five panelists who will be speaking to us today. The, the panel, I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak, but I will also introduce all of the panelists and they will go in that order. Each will have 10 minutes. The first panelist and also my co-author on the equity mid who led also the Shirk funded project. Uh, we had a four year Shirk funded project on this book is Dr. Francis Henry, Professor Emerita at uh, York University, uh, singularly one of Canada's leading experts in the area and study of racism and anti-racism. She has consistently published and pioneered a trailblazing work in this area since the mid seventies. In effect, since we have actually been talking about these areas in great detail. Um, but in addition to the equity myth uh, about which she will be speaking, she has in, her work has included the color of democracy, racism in the university, demanding social justice and inclusion. She's a member of the Royal Society since 1989, has served in many committees, including to advance uh, equity within the Royal Society. And at, at, at this time, she's part of task, the task force on COVID-19. I also want to point out that Dr. Henry, um, and I hope she can speak to this, was, a mem was, the, was the expert who actually went to Queen's University in 2001 and coined the, the concept of culture of whiteness, where she reviewed the experiences of racialized and indigenous peoples back then and turned that report over to Susan Fortier, who's now the president of McGill. So followed by Dr. Uh, Henry is Dr. Handel Wright, who um, is uh, one of uh, UBC's renowned professors in the Department of Educational Studies and director of the Center for Culture, Identity and Education. He is the co-editor of African and Diaspora Cultural Studies, um, a U of T book series, and serves on the editorial board of several journals, including Critical Arts and the European Journal of Cultural Studies. His research covers um, theorization of research methodology, um, African cultural studies, multiculturalism, critical race theory, and post-colonial decolonial thought. He is on the mayor of Vancouver's advisory committee on Black History Month and the city of Vancouver's equality advisory. He is also serves on the vice uh, presidential strategic implementation committee for equity and diversity, where he chairs the race and leadership working group, and he's a founding member of the Black Caucus. An important book that's forthcoming 
well, he has two of them. One is a co-edited book on Black British Columbia, and the other is Nuances of Blackness in the Canadian Academy. Uh, and, and I'm pleased to serve as a co-editor of that book with uh, Dr. Wright. Following Dr. Wright is Dr. Uh, Cheryl Lightfoot, also renowned to many of you at the University of British Columbia. Anishinaabe, a citizen of Lake Superior Band of the Ojibwe. She is a Canada Research Chair in Global Indigenous Rights and Politics and Associate Professor in Political Science, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs and Indigenous Studies. She's also Senior Advisor to the President on Indigenous Affairs and has a co-lead on the development of the Indigenous Strategic Plan. She ha she's uh, world-renowned for her work on Indigenous politics. She is the author of the internationally renowned book, Global Indigenous Politics, a, Su a Subtle Revolution, as well as numerous articles and books chapters. Our fourth speaker uh, is Dr. Nainan Abraham, who have I had, the, again, the, the privilege of working with over several years, and again, who is in great demand, both at the University of British Columbia, but also nationally uh, for his, his uh, groundbreaking data. <clears throat> an analysis, excuse me. He is the Associate Dean, Equity and Diversity in UBC's Faculty of Science, a professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, and the Department of Zoology. He runs a research lab examining the regulation of the cells of the immune system by cyto cy cytokine. An associate dean, he has responsibility for equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, including the training of faculty search committees, faculty data analysis, generation of equity, diversity, um, progress, reports to the faculty of science, and liaising with UBC's um, equity and inclusion offices and EDI offices. I can also say that just even just yesterday, I spent the day talking to NSERC people about why they actually need to talk to Dr. Abraham about his groundbreaking data. And finally, our panel will be anchored by Dr. Matani, Mattel Matani, who is a scholar and journalist of South Asian and Iranian Muslim descent. She's an associate professor in, at the Institute of Social Justice at UBC. She's also the senior advisor to the Provost on Racialized Faculty, where she supports the recruitment and retention of racialized faculty. Dr. Matani is a former national, tel not just a former national television uh, journal and news journalist at CBC, she is renowned across the country for her, uh, her journalistic uh, acumen, really a role model in this area. Her program was unapologetically anti-racist and feminist in, in its focus. Um, she has worked for years uh, around addressing systemic racism and discrimination. The show, Sense of Place, won four awards, but Dr. Matani's books have won awards. Dr. Matani, herself has won awards. Too many for me to address, but I'll just note one of the books, um, Mixed Race Amnesia, and, a re and one of the uh, major awards, Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal, um, as well as the Enhancing Diversity Award from the Association of American Geographers. So we have a, an impressive lineup of speakers who will address some of the key issues around revisiting the equity myth racialization, indigeneity, and the nuances of blackness at Canadian universities. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over or the Zoom over to Dr. Francis Henry of York University. Dr. Henry. Uh, well, I'm trying. Yes, okay, it's worked. Well, thank you, Melinda, uh, a dear colleague of mine from the equity myth and other famous events, I think. A uh, special thanks to President Ono for uh, starting this uh, really extraordinary uh, set of panels and discussions on a very important topic. Now, I want to use my time with you to set the stage, to raise the question of basic, the basic question, what is racism? And why does it exist at a university of all hallowed places? 
We don't normally think of the academy, that very hallowed place of learning, knowledge, and study existing since medieval times and staffed with highly trained, smart, sometimes brilliant people. We don't think of that as a site of unfairness, inequity, and inequality. But think of the university as an organization, as a structure, just like any other institution in society. As a system, it doesn't sell groceries or cell phones, but it provides a basic necessity in modern society, learning, education, and research. But like any organization, it is managed by a system of rules, regulations, policies, and procedures. Among them, racism, and specifically anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism exists. Many people do not really understand what racism is and what it consists of. Many people think that racism is an act of violence or a physical act. You remember the cross burnings in earlier days in history, uh, the assaults against people, which of course, unfortunately, we see again today. Um, name calling. All these and many other examples are overt physical acts. In fact, today, racism can almost be invisible and is judged or understood only by its consequences on disadvantaging certain groups of people. And I, I think this is an important thing to really understand, that racism in its modern version is almost impossible, invisible and it can only be seen or understood by its consequences. That is the inequity and the disadvantage of certain groups of people. For example, rules or policies in an organization that treat people unfairly or deny them rights. In earlier times, we used to have signs that said no Negroes need apply or even no Irish here, and sometimes no Jews allowed. These were open, blatant rules that discriminated against certain categories of people based on their skin color, their ethnicity, or their religion, and in fact, many other factors. Today, and unfortunately, I think we have far more insidious hidden rules that often lead to the same end of unfairness and inequity. The term to describe the rules, policies, and programs that apply to certain categories of people is called systemic racism, or sometimes structural racism. And our book, The Equity Myth, uh, provides many examples of such. There are, however, two other dimensions of racism today that we need to consider. And these are unconscious bias and white privilege. We all as human beings have biases and some that are unconscious and that we are not aware of in our ordinary day-to-day -day behavior. But for example, in employment areas, do we unconsciously reject worthy, meritorious applicants because they have a funny, strange sounding name or because they are not white skinned or their ethnicity is, is a, a group that one can't even pronounce? Uh, and we feel, or some of us feel, that people like this just don't fit. They don't fit with our established, read white, culture or organization. These acts of unconscious bias may also include what are called microaggressions or everyday racism, small acts of daily 
behavior, referring, for example, to a group as you people. Asking the question, and where are you from? From a perfectly wonderful English speaker. Not sitting next to a person of color on the subway or on the bus. Sometimes it's the only seat vacant and it is left vacant. Not getting into an elevator because a racialized person is already in it. These are examples of small acts, microaggressions, everyday racism. White privilege refers to the inherent advantages possessed by a white person on the basis of their race in a society characterized by racial inequality and injustice. The groundbreaking essay, White Privilege, Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack, was published in 1988 by Peggy McIntosh. It was be, it, in it, she described being white and the privilege that it has. She said, for example, it was being able to walk into a store and find that the main displays of shampoo and pantyhose were catered towards your hair type and your skin tone. It was being able to turn on the television and see people of your race widely represented. It was being able to move through life without being racially profiled or unfairly stereotyped. All of these are aspects of racism that take place at universities, which are large scale organizations, just like the usual ones in our society. For example, uh, in, at the university, hiring processes not totally open. Tenure and promotion criteria don't apply to some people the constitution of certain committees, overworking racialized and indigenous faculty, and, and, and many, many more of these. Racism at the university is not new. In my own experience while teaching, I heard many complaints from students and even from faculty. And as far back as, well, uh, 2000, um, and one, 2002, I was engaged as a consultant to Queen's University, as Melinda has men mentioned. And why? Because it was the result of racist allegations that some of their faculty of color, primarily women, had made against the university, allegations of racism. My report, the so-called, and I think unfortunately, Henry report came out in 2003. And one of my conclusions was the following. Note that this was many years ago. Quote, white privilege and power continue to be reflected in the Eurocentric curricula, traditional pedagogical approaches, hiring, promotion, and tenure practices, and opportunities for research at Queens. These conditions still prevail. We are now at crossroads. We have the reports. We have a few policies. We have declared that EDI is crucial to the smooth running of a university. But we haven't seen real transformative change. More than just cosmetic changes, like placing a person of color into a high administrative position, but without real power to change its structure. <coughs> or equity offices that have no real power either. And of course, we are living with the background of Black Lives Matter, which set a standard for transformation. Therefore, let my, let I, I want to urge this group, because you are all, as I understand it, important administrative leaders to stop the, com the, the communities, stop the inquiries, stop the commissions, stop the task forces, but commit to designing action-oriented programs and policies that will help to bring about substantive, transformative, and structural changes at the university. Thank you. 
Thank you, Francis. Next, we will turn to Dr. Handel Wright. Um, thank you very much, Melinda. Um, uh, greetings, uh, everyone uh, from Richmond, uh, which is part of the traditional ancestral and unceded <laughs> land of some of the Coast Salish peoples, especially the Kwantlen, the Toasan, and the Mosqueam. And I want to thank everybody who's been involved in organizing this event and um, for inviting me to participate. I consider this leadership forum theme an indication that, the, that under the leadership of our openly anti-racist activist president, uh, Santa Ono, UBC wants to urgently and directly tackle the problem of systemic racism. And we are hopefully dispensing with what I am starting to refer to as institutional fragility, by which I mean the discomfort about addressing race and racism, the defensiveness, the foot dragging, the unconvinced perfunctory participation. Rather, UBC is taking a stance as an ally or better yet, as an aspiring institutional social justice change champion. Now, as important as the process and goal of utilizing anti-racism to address systemic bias at UBC is in and of itself, I see it also as part of the move towards the more comprehensive goal of inclusive excellence at UBC. And I say that with thanks to Sarah Jane Finley for introducing me to that very utilitarian concept. As someone who has been a professor at UBC for 15 years, after some 10 years in the US, and who teaches and undertakes research on identity, difference, anti-racism, and related discourses, I want to signal what I consider an important caveat to the very framework we're employing in the emergent, urgent work of addressing systemic racism at UBC. My caveat is there is a need to consider specificity and the politics of difference and equity within and beside an anti-racism frame. By specificity, I mean that different equity-seeking groups as the normal language is used in the discourse or as University of Toronto Vice President Wisdom Tetty prefers, and I agree, equity denied groups or equity deserving groups have been subject to racism in different forms and therefore race, addressing racism against each necessitates a somewhat different approach. By a politics of difference and equity, I mean that rather than a broad anti-racism applied for all groups, which would be an equality frame, there's a need for a more nuanced approach for recognition of the difference within each group. That is that gender, sexuality, ability, place of origin, about differences and power differentials within each ethno-racial group. Secondly, and even more important for this discussion, there's a need for different emphasis or even entirely different models for different equity denied groups. And I think that in combination makes for an equity frame. And I want to illustrate this by referring to how black people can be situated at UBC. Racism against black people of the most grotesque kind has horrified all of us. And that combined with episodes of racism against black students on the Vancouver campus largely constitutes the impetus for the work we are currently undertaking on addressing systemic racism at UBC. The problem here is that UBC is starting from the dark ages in terms of the very representation of blackness. Underrepresentation is acute enough that black people are what I would call an absent presence, at once not here, yet having a significant effect. Black bodies are rendered bodies that do not belong on campus. Black bodies of knowledge, ways of knowing, and approaches to pedagogy are not acknowledged, let alone validated. To start to see and acknowledge blackness via grotesque racism elsewhere and everyday racism on UBC campus, and hence 
via very necessary anti-racism work is albeit quite inadvertently and ironically to bypass black presence and agency. It is to reduce black people to individuals in need of saving or at least protection, to reduce blackness to a problem to be solved. As a black person, I see the problem of racism against individuals at UBC as a symptom of a much more comprehensive chronic disease of a truly woeful and perennial lack of representation of blackness. At a minimum, within a general anti-racism frame, there, is, there needs to be a robust, more specific component of addressing the deaf P that is anti-black racism. I know deaf P sounds like an obscure hip hop artist, but it is something of an acronym I have coined and employed in interviews, talks, and webinars that I am suddenly in high demand to give on racism and anti-racism. By deaf P, I mean to reference the specific characteristics of anti-Black racism as I see them, namely the D of denial, the E of exclusion, and the F of forgetting, which together result in the P of the paradox of invisibility and hypervisibility. The lack of Blackness at UBC can all too easily result in anti-Black racism getting lost in the shuffle of a generalized anti-racism frame. We need a separate committee on and commitment to addressing Blackness at UBC. UBC is one of the largest and most prestigious universities in Canada. It is problematic that we do not have dedicated student scholarships and fellowships and fa faculty grants on Blackness. It is troubling that Black staff and Black faculty remain so rare as to be distinct oddities on both campuses, that we do not have uh, Blacks in leadership positions, that we do not have Black place, dedicated physical space for Blackness. It is quite frustrating that we do not even have the granular disaggregated data that will give us an accurate picture of Black presence at UBC. It is quite simply unconscionable that we have no Black studies at UBC, or we have an undergraduate African studies minor. And as an African, I remind you that even that precarious program is only partly about Blackness, since Africa is not synonymous with Black. We sorely need Black studies at UBC at both undergraduate and graduate levels. We need Black thought and approaches within the various disciplines. We need an interdisciplinary Black Studies program led by an appropriate chair located in a Black center. We are squandering the opportunity to create a particularly unique Black Studies that would be notable internationally. I'm encouraged by the fact that parallel to the UBC efforts at anti-racism in general, there is at UBC Okanagan an attempt to touch on this larger project of Black representation. To start with talk about the possibility of Black studies initiated by Provost and VP academic Ananya Mukherjee Reed, who has experience collaborating on, establish, on the establishment of Black studies at York University. I want to conclude by reiterating that as part of the solution to the specific problem of anti-Black racism at UBC, we are in dire need of Black presence. Blacks in leadership, Ainsley Carey being starkly solitary and hence the exception that proves the rule of exclusion. We need Black UBC and CRC chairs and we need cluster hires of Black academics and we need staff hires, and we need Black studies. I urge that our anti-racism work be more nuanced and equity-based. And I urge we establish a committee on and commitment to addressing the larger problem of the gross underrepresentation of Blackness at UBC. Doing all of this, normalizing Black presence, will bring Blackness to the starting blocks of UBC's already commenced race against institutional racism. 
this is not an appeal to UBC's largesse, but an invitation to UBC to include blackness and hence make more attainable the larger goal of inclusive excellence at UBC. Thank you. Thank you, Handel. Next is Dr. Cheryl Lightfoot. Thank you, Dr. Smith, and thank you, Dr. Wright, and Dr. Henry for your comments before me. And I also want to just take a moment to acknowledge President Ono uh, and his courage for holding these conversations this week and his tenacity in leading uh, us into these conversations. So greetings to all of you. I actually live on campus, so I can acknowledge the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people uh, from which I am joining you this afternoon. And I want to take my time just to revisit the Indigenous Strategic Plan, because for those of you who were here a year ago, my co-lead, Dr. Margaret Moss and I, and our team joined you at this leadership forum with our very first engagement on the development of the 2020 Indigenous Strategic Plan, or ISP for short, which we've now finalized. And this plan, including its action plan, is historic and pathbreaking for three important reasons, and we need to highlight those. This is the first university strategic framework in Canada to integrate the TRC calls to action, the missing murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiries calls for justice, and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as its foundational framework, all three documents. And no other university in Canada has yet done this and relied on all three documents in, in a human rights approach. It's also the first post-secondary institution in the English speaking world to pledge an explicit implementation commitment on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And then thirdly, it is the first Indigenous strategic framework to use the principles of the UN Declaration and a human rights approach as its method of development. And each one of these individual reasons is significant in our discussion today and to where we are collectively headed next with implementation. Take us to the next slide, please. So this is an infographic that just reminds you of where we've been in the past year as we've been developing this action plan, uh, goals and action items that you can now find in the finished plan. And because we had no template in the world for what implementing all three of these documents would mean in practice for a post-secondary institution, let alone one as large and complex as UBC, we turned to all of our communities internally and a bit externally for ideas and suggestions. So in our first round of engagements, we asked uh, in, through in-person engagements and then through an online survey, what specific actions UBC can take and should take in order to implement those three documents. And I have to tell you that the response we received in numerical terms was beyond our wildest expectations. We had in total nearly 2,000 people across UBC provide us with 15,000 ideas and suggestions on the question of what UBC should be doing. After we conducted an analysis of these 15,000 inputs, we compared them in close detail with the high level documents. And we produced a first draft, which we then sent around for additional feedback beginning in February. And in the second round, uh, we asked some confirming questions. Is this right? Did we get this right? And then also we asked the various communities to go back and prioritize the different action items. Next slide, please. Now I have to share with you, uh, unfortunately, some of what we found um, in terms of overt racism. And some of these will be difficult to read, but it's important that we all read them together in case anyone has any misperceptions about indigenous racism, anti-indigenous racism at UBC. So if you could take us to the next slide. Um, remember, we asked in the online survey, 
what UBC can and should do in order to advance these documents. So we can quickly throw, scroll through and you can read some of the quite overtly racist responses that we received. And I'm actually not gonna dignify some of these um, by reading them out and you can read them as we scroll by. So while I would say these are disheartening and even distressing, I can assure you that when we read them as Indigenous faculty, staff, and students, there were no surprises here. These are quite familiar. So I also want to share some of the responses we received from Indigenous voices. They are expressing that our campus feels to them like an anti-Indigenous place. And some of the first things that they have noticed are some of the prejudicial racist comments that they hear from other students uh, about their experience and the presumptions that they're making. They have heard about colonial, they've, they've experienced colonial research practices, observed tokenism and various forms of racism and discrimination. And they express these to us. They expressed the misperceptions and myths that they are confronted with every single day um, from things like university must be free for you, how lovely. Uh, and they also said that they experience uh, overtly racist professors in their classes. And they also highlighted the problem of asking uh, Indigenous students in their courses, the, the professors ask them to be representatives of Indigenous people or to be experts on, on everything Indigenous. So these are some of the subtle and, and everyday ways that racism is experienced uh, by Indigenous students, faculty, and staff. Go ahead and next slide, please. And what has become clear in the years, especially since 2015, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission tabled its final report, and then also was amplified through our engagements in these 15,000 inputs that we took in, it's clear to us that an additive approach to Indigenous engagement at UBC is no longer sufficient. And I think we can all be proud of the tremendous number and large number of high quality world, world leading indigenous specific programs and initiatives in recent decades, going back to the 1970s. And some of these are quite familiar and notable to, to folks across campus, like the NITEP teacher training program, the Indigenous Legal Clinic, the First Nations House of Learning, the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program, Musqueam Language Program. These are world famous, world renowned programs, and we have every right to be proud of them. And what we saw very early on in our process was that while it's essential that we keep building initiatives like these and fund them properly and give them all the support, we also have to begin on transforming systems in order to address the deeper systemic racisms that are present within the university and which encompass so much more than just the overt racist attacks like we saw above. Because these are the systems and structures that in an everyday basis marginalize, exclude and erase indigenous students and staff and faculty contributions that presume that indigenous peoples and communities are research subjects rather than research partners and that the university can solve indigenous problems rather than working with indigenous peoples and knowledges to help them bring their contributions to solving societal problems like social justice or climate change, just to name a few. So we developed through this process, a set of eight goals and 43 action steps. Go ahead to the next slide. And these goals and action steps are intended to help UBC as a collective address these multitude forms of systemic racism and begin to shift and see indigenous peoples as partners, collaborators, co-developers of knowledge. Next slide. 
So as I mentioned, in our second round of engagement, we conducted a prioritization exercise. And what we can report to you is the top three goals in the aggregate from both campuses were, as you see here, moving research forward in a way that acknowledges indigenous rights, indigenizing the curriculum and recruiting more indigenous people into our spaces. Next slide. So where we go from here and what you will begin to see as we roll out the action steps that will advance these goals over time. And you can go to indigenous.ubc.ca to learn much more about the plan and you can watch that space for further activity. We uh, will be coming forward with uh, some funding opportunities and updates in order to advance particular action steps of the plan. We will be forming some new advisories along the way very soon to help support uh, the VPs in the executive level as well as continue the work uh, that has already been going on for a number of years on both campuses, ISPIC at Vancouver and the IAC at the Okanagan. And we will try to develop the best possible network to ad advance the agenda through all of these committees. And we will be launching a particular ISP website in probably early 21 is the hope. And then we were also developing some workshops and toolkits to help each faculty staff unit address and advance these particular goals and action steps. So I'm going to leave this with you there and turn back to Dr. Smith to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Cheryl, for that uh, excellent presentation and uh, following the previous uh, uh, presentations. Our next speaker is Dr. Nainan Abraham, again, one of UBC's uh, own talents. Thank you, President Ono, Dr. Smith, Dr. Finley, for putting together this wonderful event and inviting me to speak. I'll start by acknowledging that uh, I'm an immigrant settler to this uh, land and I have the pleasure and privilege of uh, working, um, doing my research, teaching and living on the traditional unceded uh, territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and the Squamish peoples. So the work I'm going to show you today was done with uh, Corolla Hibbs Yetter, the Strategic Initiatives Manager in the Faculty of Science, with collaboration with Dr. Minel Matani in her portfolio as the Senior Advisor to the Provost for Racialized Faculty, and in collaboration with Dr. Nancy Heckman, Department of, Department of Statistics at UBC. So this is a first past analysis of observations we made uh, looking at metrics we had gathered of our faculty with some caveats that I will mention where relevant. So I'm going to start off by sharing our practical advice for how to make uh, your, uh, how you can make improvements in hiring racialized faculty. And this is how we did it. One of the first things we learned is that how we conduct faculty hiring has a gatekeeping function. The next thing you have to uh, establish is to know your department's uh, d diversity and what that requires is an encouragement of uh, self-identification on the UBC equity census. This already exists and what we need is to build your faculty members trust to, uh, to get them to do this. They need to believe that you will act on what you will find. The more recent thing we have learned is that surveying ancestry is a really powerful um, uh, means of, 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 of determining several things. One of the things it'll achieve is to uh, allow disaggregation of visible minorities, which I'll tell you what I mean by that. And the other, uh, the reason that's critical is that it's the only way to detect anti-Black, anti-Indigenous, anti-Asian racism. And one of the final things it'll, it'll show that we'll show you is that using this allows us to avoid systemic underestimation of who's trying to get into the academy. We've learned that expanding shortlists of uh, uh, processes um, is critical. A five candidate minimum seems to be a threshold point where you can see significant um, uh, barriers to underrepresented groups. Having more than one uh, underrepresented group member has a certain has a, uh, a discernible benefit as well. We have now uh, required diversity statements in our job ads, and that allows us to um, ensure that uh, candidates that we recruit help UBC meet its stated objectives and policy too. We uh, ensure accountability of our uh, committees. Uh, what I call, did I just switch my display? I'm sorry, but go back to full screen. 
Zoom is such an awkward medium. I think I've mastered it by now. So accountability upward and downward refers to the fact that we want to hold your committee accountable uh, to, to reflect the diversity of the incoming pool, but also upward in that we uh, uh, have our search committees justify their selection uh, to the dean's office, to two associate deans who do what's called the second look. The other critical thing that you have to do is to groom diverse leadership. Who are your committee chairs? Who are your associate heads and the program leads? And the last thing which I'll touch on is to develop an intersectional lens, which we'll get to. So in fact, of science, we have closely tracked metrics on two things, our existing faculty and uh, uh, faculty recruitment. And so one of the most striking findings from our faculty study of the last two years are that visible minority or racialized faculty, as I'll, I'll refer to them interchangeably, have a larger diversity gap than female faculty. They're glaringly underrepresented in the leadership and they face gatekeeping uh, during the hiring process. So our employment equity census response rate is, 90, is, is 74%, which allows us a fairly close view of the intersectional diversity of our gender and uh, visible minorities or racialized faculty based on self-identification, which is the gold standard. This exceeds the federal contractor's program reporting minimum of 70%. And so this is essential um, in, in, in one other faculty I know of, which has a 24% response rate, it'd be hard to do the department level analysis that I'm gonna show you. So white males make up 60% of our fac faculty based on self-reporting, white women make up 24%, racialized uh, women make up about 5% and racialized males make up about 11%. So our racialized faculty uh, component at 16% in, in, in faculty of science is below the U15 average of 21% racialized faculty. We do not know the UBC wide racialized diversity as of yet, which we hope will change. For that matter, we don't know uh, the diversity of our staff, our grad students or undergraduate student uh, uh, diversity profiles. One caveat is that there is a potential non-response bias here. So, you know, if 25% of people are not responding and they're predominantly white or the opposite, you could have an over or underestimate. What we have done is that we know that this is reasonably accurate because we've done an independent estimate of racialized faculty in, in, in our, our faculty. And what that has yielded is it closely resembles the racialized percentage using a headshot coding, which is an alternative approach used in sociology. So this graph shows us the representation of the diversity of faculty of science leadership for the last 20 years. We're using person years to better reflect historical representation. So white women represent, uh, represented in the faculty at 24% are underrepresented at the heads level, but are well represented at the associate dean and the dean level. Racialized women make up 5% of the faculty, but no woman of color has ever served as a head associate dean or dean. Racialized men at 11% are underrepresented at all leadership levels. There's one male person of color uh, who serves as a head, and I'm the first and only racialized person to serve in the dean's leadership team. White men who make up 60% of the faculty at large are overrepresented at all levels of, the, of, of these 20 years. Such insights are helping the faculty of science strategic plan and shaping it, and it's being taken seriously at all levels. Now this graph, shows us the representation um, uh, of our, our, our faculty diversity across different units. This high response rate allows us a granular department level analysis of the diversity of the existing faculty. We also have data collected for every faculty search done for the last 10 years. What we've shown here is the differential between our racialized faculty diversity within our units with the average racialized uh, uh, candidate percentage who applied over the last nine years to join our faculty. And what you can see is that faculty of science as a whole, which is the top orange bar, is to the left of the zero mark, which means that most departments fall short of reflect reflecting the available pool. Units in orange indicate a significant gap of racialized faculty at the 95% confidence level. You can see a few there. One, the units that have number uh, NS or number suppressed have fewer than four such individuals that prevent us from reporting the metrics due to privacy concerns, uh, which means that we have at least four units that have no critical mass of racialized faculty and one has zero faculty who are racialized. So contrast that for women in data. Not a single department has zero or number suppressed, which is a good thing. One caveat I will mention is that we are benchmarking recruitment of faculty over the last, who knows, 30, 35 years against a candidate pool average that's taken over the last nine years. So is that really fair? Is it truly representative to compare our net you know, recruitment uh, given that the, the diversity of candidates 
30 to 35 years ago might not be reflected in this, this metric. So we did do a, 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 an analysis that I'm not gonna show here where we examine re restricting this analysis to just assistant and associate professors, professors who were hired more recently. And what I can tell you is the picture is definitely better for women. For women, faculty wide, this bar is now in the plus five range. All right, so that, that it, but it, in contrast to women, for racialized faculty, it is still extremely poor, with six out of 12 units having no assistant or associate professors who self identify as visible minority. So, what our ass assessment suggests is that diversity gap is worse for racialized faculty than it is for women in the faculty of science. If we assume that merit was the sole determinant of success in getting who was getting hired, we'd expect a random distribution across the zero axis. And instead, what we see is that five out of these 12 units are significantly to the left of the zero mark, including two with numbers suppressed that actually we can't show you but have double digit deficits. And this is not a random distribution and is indicative of systemic biases in hiring or retention. So we look closely at the hiring of our faculty. Our process has been honed where we can follow each step of the hiring processes represented by these four colored bars. These are graphs showing each step of the process for successful research stream searches during these past uh, seven years. We narrowed it down to um, the research stream because the trends are different for education leadership stream and it's layered on top of a notable gender shift. So we've focused our attention on research stream to, to uh, uh, get at the issue of um, gender and racialized diversity uh, disparities. So the difference in graph heights are uh, indicative of, of specific elements within the step of that process. So for example, comparing uh, this light blue step to this teal step reflects the process of shortlisting, which is a function of search committees, whereas the uh, comparison between the red bar to the purple bar, which is the uh, representation of, women, of, of offers to those who actually get hired, reflect our success in being able to land candidates. And so for women, what you can see is that they make up about 21% of the applicant pool. They uh, are highly successful in getting shortlisted, but close to 30% getting shortlisted. And slightly less than 25% get offers, and we land about 26% 20, of them in that seven year period. For racialized candidates, you can see that uh, there's a marked reduction in the percentage who are shortlisted compared to, uh, to those, uh, the percentage in the candidate pool. Once on the shortlist, however, they fare reasonably well. What we've noted in data that I won't show you is that this problem is unique to solitary racialized candidates who fare poorly unlike solitary female candidates. And this has been described as a status quo effect of being seen as outside the status quo when you're a sole visible minority candidate. On shortlists with two or more visible minority candidates, or in, in fact, for two or more female candidates, there are markedly better outcomes on percentage who get offers and, and, and recruited. In addition, I'll show you one more statistic from these searches. We noted that while one in six searches over these seven years had no women shortlisted, fully twice as many, uh, 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 one in three failed to shortlist any racialized candidate. So the question is, how can we diversify our recruitment if we are unaware of the extent of the exclusion of visible minorities in even getting the foot into the door by getting onto a shortlist? So both these metrics are indicative of systemic biases faced by racialized candidates and a gatekeeping role in search committees. So employment equity is not new. The act came to be in 1986. When it comes to hiring visible minorities, our patterns of hiring have not shifted much from the 1990s. So we adjusted how we do things in hiring. That's what I'm going to show you in the next slide. So we changed our emphasis and broadened our lens in our search processes over the last two years. The metrics of hiring uh, um, over that period has shown some improvement in the patterns of, of hiring. So on the left is the pro progress through hiring for racialized faculty, as I showed you in the last uh, slide. On the right, we can see that in the last year, we had a marked increase in our success with racialized candidates. Despite only 25% applicants, we expanded the percentage shortlisted to 35% with 40% getting offers going to underrepresented groups uh, and 35% um, uh, uh, recruitment rate compared to just 24% in the past. Not shown is that the success in recruiting women is even more dramatic, approaching 70% recruitment rate. The caveat here is that the applicant pool representation is based on identification surveys, and we have an opt-in uh, uh, survey which, is, which could be improved, uh, but the response rates here are 69% versus 75% here. And so it's conceivable that this non-reporting bias could shift these up or down. However, the subsequent bars in the, these three colors here 
are showing shortlist offers and recruited candidates, which are hard census numbers based on direct firsthand reporting. As such, our observations suggest that the changes we made have a positive effect on outcomes and what those changes are uh, shown on the, on the right. So we expanded our shortlist um, to five candidates minimum. We had more than one member of an underrepresented group shortlisted and we use in-person committee training with active learning and we have a second look at shortlist. I'm going to finish if I have time with, with one final uh, note. This is an observation we made that what question you ask in a survey is critical. In the previous years, we ran our search process with just this question, do you identify as a member of visible minority? Uh, and we provided the definition uh, that's used uh, to, 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 to make clear what what um, this term refers to, the employment equity definition, as well as the usage in Canada. And out of 1,550 respondents, 24% indicated being a visible minority. We learned from others that questions on ancestry were highly effective in that they do not privilege whiteness and were a neutral question. Everyone identifies with their ancestry. And so we ran our faculty candidate surveys asking both these questions here. Do you identify as a visible minority? And how do you identify your ancestry? And intriguingly, 52% of people indicated an ancestry that was non-white, non-indigenous, which meets the classification of visible minority according to Stats Canada. That is, if we included such ancestry responses in, in, to those who self-identify as racialized, twice as many of our applicants were visible minorities than we had thought based on the first question. This suggests that our actual diversity gaps may be systematically underestimated unless we write, ask the right questions. I'm gonna skip the next slide because I know I'm probably over time and I can't see Dr. Smith, so I'm just gonna skip. There is disparities in who identifies as visible minority, yes or no. Even black individuals have a 24% rate. Uh, East Asians have a 52% rate saying no. South Asians, 48% saying no. West Asians have about 60% saying no, and multiracial in individuals have a 70% rate saying they're not visible minorities or don't identify that way. And so I'm going to wrap up with the uh, conclusion slide. When broken down, uh, sorry, to sum up, the take-home points are how we conduct hiring has a significant effect. You have to build trust in the equity census. It's now adopted with the UBC equity census being rolled out in Workday. It's the key way in which we can really disaggregate data and detect anti-Black, anti-Asian racism, and also avoids the underestimation using a flawed question. We expanded our shortlist, and we have we encourage more than one uh, underrepresented group member. We do not ask for tokenism. We want uh, search committees to understand the systemic barriers that underrepresented group uh, members uh, face and uh, to, to account for that fully. We require a diversity statement, which allows a better insight into the candidates who are applying. We require accountability both up and down. We, we ensure we groom our diverse leadership and we uh, certainly think about more than just gender versus race. We try to think about things intersectionally, although this data uh, had only partial intersectional analysis. So the faculty of science has been transparent about what we've learned about ourselves. And while it is not perfect, there's a deep-seated commitment to anti-racism at all levels, from Dean Aronson, the associate deans, the heads, to the faculty, staff, and students. My final point is we have a chance to be leaders in anti-racism and inclusion, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Um, next, we will turn the, uh, really appreciate that uh, analysis. We'll turn the floor over to Dr. Manel Matani. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Melinda. I wanna begin by echoing my thanks to President Ono. I think he is visionary in his efforts and commitment to eradicate systemic racism through events like this. And I'm very grateful to be part of this event today. I think you've heard some fantastic speakers who have really helped us consider the kinds of structural change we want to encourage here at UBC. But I also want to say something a bit more unusual that I'm not sure has been fully recognized here today. And that is, I know that you're tired. There's a very real administrative burnout happening right now. I hear about it daily from faculty who also serve as heads of departments. You're being asked to implement Workday. You have the PAIE plans to consider. You're being asked to do all sorts of extra work right now, trying to make serious headway on all these fronts during a pandemic, no less. And I think it's taking a cognitive, physical, and spiritual toll on leadership. I see you. And in light of all of this, it would be so easy to say, let's just keep the issue of race on the back burner for now. I'm going to suggest that now must be the time to address it. In fact, it's an opportunity for us to make visible and lasting upward movement on systemic racism. 
So in light that it's almost the end of the day, around five o'clock, I'm gonna do something a little bit different from what you've heard already. I'm gonna share a personal story to help shed some light on the relationship between the personal and systemic, particularly understanding the differences around racism. Some of you might know that I'm writing a book about silences right now, what we don't say when we talk about race. And I recently found the following. It's a copy of a letter that I wrote when I was in the job market after I interviewed for a position at a university. Here it is. Dear Dr. X, I write to issue a complaint against the way I was treated during my interview for the lecturer position. I believe the department's behavior towards me to be degrading in both a racist and sexist manner. I chose to interview at your school because it seemed like an ideal place to work and live and I was delighted to learn that I was selected as a candidate and prepared extensively for the interview, preparing five syllabi and planning a detailed explanation about how my research could be extended at your school. However, after my formal interview, I was told by the head of department that my candidacy was unlikely. Several reasons were cited. I was told that staff members thought it was odd for me to ask for a stapler before a meeting. I was also told that I was uncollegial and unsocial. I was even accused by a faculty member that I only use the interview as an excuse to travel to your country. I was also told when queried what was going on from a faculty member, well, what do you expect? You're a woman. And you're not only that, you're a woman of color and you don't even keep quiet about it. I responded to these concerns about my supposed antisocial behavior to the best of my ability, including delaying my flight out of the city so I can continue more informal discussions with staff and faculty members, although we all know there's no such thing as an informal meeting during a job interview. I also arranged to have breakfast and tea meetings with faculty in order to demonstrate my strong desire to lecture at your school. These comments about my suitability demonstrate pervasive sexist and racist undercurrents in your department. And I believe that if I was a man, I would not have been talked down to like a child about my so-called inappropriate behavior. Clearly, suitable female candidates should be meek and acquiescent in order to be seen as an appropriate colleague. And as many of my reference letters indicate, my personable, easygoing, and cheerful manner has always been noted and complimented on in my reference letters by geographers around the world, see enclosed. Lecturer positions should be awarded not on the basis of collegiality, but also on the basis of scholarly achievement and lecturing ability. When I asked if anyone had any concerns about the quality of my research or the quality of my presentations, I was begrudgingly told by the head of department that both my presentations were excellent, as were the quality of my syllabi. If your institution envisions itself as world class, it's going to have to diversify its faculty and hiring practices. Unfortunately, conservative departments tend to feel most comfortable hiring candidates who are just like them. These practices are justified through the employment of an ever shifting and nebulous notion of sociability and collegiality that is used in turn to prevent the hiring of faculty of color. Clearly in my personal demeanor proved threatening to the all white and mostly male staff at your school. And it strikes me as no coincidence that two of your female faculty have chosen to leave your department in the last two years further intensifying your gender imbalance. If you are to recruit international world-class candidates in the future, I recommend that you treat your female interviewees with greater respect, dignity, and decency. Patronizing your candidates in a racist and sexist way does nothing to encourage women of color to consider a position at your school. I sincerely hope the department will take these considerations during your next hire. Sincerely, Manal Matani. I still remember the fear I experienced in writing that email, my heart palpitating as I hit sent. Now I never heard anything back, nor did I expect to, but I'm telling you this story for a reason. I'm telling you that this is not an isolated event. So many of us have experiences like this. They seem to accumulate over time. They carry more and more weight and they wear us down. The feminist theorist Sarah Ahmed tells us that this is about being weighed down as well as worn down. You seem to receive the same message again and again. And these experiences, what effect do they have? What do they do? The story is common. I hear comments like, I hear, I hear these kinds of experiences every day in my job. It's not a one-off. It's more than just a personal experience. I'm hard pressed to think of any racialized faculty member who hasn't experienced something like this or much worse. And I'm one of the lucky ones as a light-skinned woman of color who can sometimes pass. Others have not been so fortunate. And therein lies the link between the personal and the systemic. Systemic racism is a form of racism that is embedded as normal practice within an organization. It's about the repetition of these obstacles as Dr. Smith explained in her opening statement. And this in fact is not an isolated experience for racialized scholars. 
It is the norm on the job market while they wait for a coffee at Great Dane, while they sit in faculty meetings, and it's what inspired me to take on this job in the first place. I want to take the last few minutes of my time to talk about some of the initiatives that I've been working on in my, as my role as senior advisor to the provost on racialized faculty. The two major initiatives have included Ignite, a book club where we use stories, mostly memoirs, as a way of sharing insights around structural racism to illuminate forms of racial inequality, where racialized faculty interview racialized writers, our first event a year ago with renowned Black writer David Chirianti was overwhelmingly successful with over 200 people present. We followed it up with conversations with Desmond Cole and the recent Jack Webster Award winner, the Indigenous journalist Professor Candace Callison. We're also proud of the Provost Distinguished Lecture Series on Race and Leadership, and I want to commend our Provost Andrew Zeri for having the vision to support this lecture series where we invited both Damon Williams and Arig Al Sheba, accomplished AVPs on equity and inclusion to speak with administrators, staff, and faculty about systemic racism. And I'm proud of these projects because I've received powerful feedback from both racialized and non-racialized faculty about the impact it's made in helping build community and offer moral support, as well as education to those who are new to understanding how systemic racism operates. But of course, these initiatives are only part of a larger project that I'm committed to during my tenure in this role that includes prioritizing structural process, structural and process change. When I first started here, I remember having lunch with Hubert Lai, who a lot of you will know. He told me, Manal, the university culture is like a tank. It takes time to turn around. And I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that, me too. But what we can do in this room is commit to making those changes together. So I'd like to end by suggesting that you ask some new questions. And a lot of these are things that Professor Nine and Adrian raised so beautifully in his talk. Who is mentoring your racialized faculty? Do you know if they are being recruited other places? Because I can guarantee you they probably are. Have you nominated them for awards? Have you had a one-on-one -on -one with them asking how you can offer support? I'm gonna leave you with this note. Dr. Ismail Traore works in the equity office and we're very lucky to have him here at UBC. He said something to me yesterday that really stayed with me. He said that racism cannot be quarantined and racism is a public health issue. Anti-racism is not just a matter of doing what is morally right. It is first and foremost a public health matter. I think it's fair to say that when he said that, it stopped all of us in our tracks. And I think we all have responsibility to remember his words today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matani. Um, <clears throat> I, we really appreciate all of those comments uh, and thoughtfully presented, well-researched. Well and now we have some time for questions. And we have uh, Dr. Sarah Jane Finley, who is monitoring the chat box for us. And the question and the Q and A, and so we will be. Um, she will be sending me various questions, and I will be sharing them with you. Um, so one of the one of the questions we have, and so my question Q and A is not working. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go to the. So so one of the early questions we had. Um, relates to the issue of, so first I, sh I should say, most of the comments uh, people are indicating they appreciate each of the speakers' contributions around uh, anti-Black racism, racialization, and Indigenous peoples. Um, and one question relates to how do we manage the intersectional challenges, ensuring that our data fairly represents identity in a manner that is respectful of people's individual choices um, in this regard. So that was one of the questions we have. Um, I will share another data question uh, that was raised uh, was how do we uh, recognize, as a question about the diversity of our student body. Um, and, there was, and, and, and I'm happy to throw that out. There are other questions and we'll come back to them. So who wants to take that? first question about intersectionality uh, and, and how the data reflects that. I think those are, in a way, two different kind, two different but interrelated questions. 
so it's open to uh, any of the speakers, presenters. I don't see Handel, Nainan, Manel, Cheryl. Who wants to start? Melinda, could you repeat what the question was? So the, the first question um, related to how do we manage the intersectional challenge? Intersectionality, how do we manage the intersectional challenge ensuring that our data fairly represents identity in a manner that is respectful of people's individual choices in this regard? So that's one data question. A second data question related to uh, how do we know the diversity of our student body? Um, and, and, and I guess, I guess the, backdrop, the background to that is why don't we know actually more about the diversity of our uh, faculty, staff, and students, and our student body. And the question is, uh, how do we, how do we uh, interpret the, the racialized and indigenous data alongside, say, gender, sexuality, indigeneity, and the like? I'll take a kick at it. Um, so we've dipped our toe into data, and we started with, with faculty because it's a smaller universe of, of a problem. Staff are thrice the number of faculty and students are you know, 10 times more or so. And when, when you do it as a, as a, as a uh, singular identity, it's, it's, it's tractable. And you, but once you get to dual, triple, quadruple identities, it becomes a data science problem. Mm -hmm. And that requires uh, data scientists to start getting involved and you know, the social scientists on this, this panel. And so we started simply, we are starting to do things intersectionally. The last two years of data we have has non-binary um, survey uh, self-identification questions. Um, I didn't get into all seven survey identification questions, but it covers indigeneity, uh, peoples with disabilities, the new work day, uh, workplace uh, uh, employment equity census that Sarah Jane Finley's group has come up with took the best of our race analysis data, but we took the best of their sexual and gender minority data, which is three questions, and a disability questions, which are now three questions, which I think will do the same thing in that we will see that we have been underestimating them. So that volume of data is need, you need resources of people who know how to deal with it. And that's mm -hmm. a limitation uh, for us. I, you know, I have a 60% individual who crunches numbers. To expand that to students right now, we would need support to do that. Anyone else wants to respond on intersectionality? Linda, I can answer the question around student data if it would be helpful. Sure. sure. Um, so uh, we collect um, data on students at the time of application and that includes um, uh, information on um, binary gender and also on um, indigenous students who've been through the um, British Columbia school system. Uh, that's the only data that's currently collected on students. We do have demographic um, questions which are included in the undergraduate experience survey uh, where students can self-identify in a number of different categories and that gives us some sense of representation, but the response rate um, isn't incredibly high. I think it's about 20%, uh, so um, the margin of error is quite large. Uh, so um, I'm, my office um, uh, is working with um, uh, the Institutional Research Office and with Enrollment Services to start a new process um, to collect data from students um, when they enroll at the university in a more um, systematic way so that we do have better disaggregated data on um, our students. Uh, thank you, Sarah Jane. I, I'll, maybe I'll add a comment on the data collection across the country. So first, the first thing I want to say is that the data on racialized faculty, staff, and students should have been should be have been collected since the beginning of employment equity. You could say maybe students less so, but faculty and staff, the workforce analysis for the federal contractors program required four data on four groups: racialized, in, uh, indigenous, women, and persons with disabilities. 
less so intersectionality that came later. So, there, so the fact, if universities aren't collecting that data, it seems to me that actually tells us everything. If you don't collect the data, not measured, doesn't get done. So the second point I wanna say then is that now that nationally, Statistics Canada, um, the, the Canada Research Chairs Program, the Dimensions EDI, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, are all calling for disaggregated racialized minority data and gender identity, gender expression, sexual orientation data, so that the push nationally is for this kind of data. Um, and then the third point I'll make about student data. 2017, CBC did a uh, research investigation. 67 universities found that few universities understood the diversity of their student body. My view, my question is, if you don't understand the diversity of your student body, how can you meet their needs? How do you know who's being left out? How do you know who's being better served? How do you know who's completing? How do you know who's, uh, and, what, and what time? So we need good data of students, staff, and faculty, and yes, we need that data disaggregated. And yes, we need to talk about the intersections of it. And just finally, most universities don't have lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer. That's now going to be required as part of five equity-seeking groups. The Employment Equity Act is under revision. Um, the better universities are out front in collecting this data. So another question is, how do, how do we uh, increase the uh, diversity among institutional leadership? But I, I would add to that, why is that actually important to the work that we are talking about uh, in, in these presentations? Is that a question, Melinda? Yes. What is, ne what is necessary to increase the diversity and university leadership? And I would just say from directors to, to chairs to all the way through the, the system. Well, I'll take a crack at that uh, because I, I think we discovered in uh, interviewing people at um, universities across the country in, in the equity myth, and that uh, Carol Tatter and I did in an earlier book as well, that one of the crucial variables in all of this is committed leadership from the top, however you define the top, at whatever level you define the top. So uh, to me, and uh, I, I, I wanna stress this actually tomorrow at the Board of Governors meeting, that they have to recognize that in their appointment of very senior staff, because the board usually has, plays a role in that. So um, I, I, I think the simple answer is that without commitment from leadership, whether that leadership is your chair, your dean, or your VP or your president is absolutely crucial to the process. Because if you as a faculty member uh, having difficulties um, have no sense of commitment from the people who you are responsible to and who have hired you and so on, uh, well, I mean, then that, that's only half the job. Uh, and uh, I think we have at universities been rather cavalier in appointing people to the top positions. And in my experience as well, I think that there are a lot of extremely able people who would make able administrators but have absolutely no interest in doing an administrative position. And I'm sure that cuts across all levels of, of faculty and is, it's not sort of divided by race or even ethnicity. There's simply a lot of very dedicated people who define their roles as teachers and as researchers, not as administrators. And I'm, I'm speaking rather openly, almost crudely about this because I was one of those having had numerous chances to be promoted, quote unquote, to administrative heights, I never did one. I did one two-year stint as a, as a department chair because there were reasons involved why politically it was necessary to do so. And I got out of there as quickly as possible. So um, I, I think this is a problem in terms of who gets these jobs sometimes. 
sometimes some of the best people who might be doing the best jobs don't want them and stay away from them. Well, then if I could uh, jump in. Um, so cl clearly I'm uh, very, very committed uh, to diversifying the leadership of this institution at every level. That's why we're having this president's la uh, leadership uh, round table discussion. And, and it's, it's for that reason that, that I've committed to a sustained effort. Um, and so I think that's, that's clear. I should say that I'm very pleased that the board of governors uh, who will be meeting with many of you uh, tomorrow is also committed. And I should say that in my years as uh, administrator in, in, in multiple nations, that uh, this is unprecedented to, to have the board of governors say to me that it's their top priority for this year and that they want to devote half of the retreat uh, to this discussion uh, is uh, really quite remarkable. So I'd say that uh, beyond the commitment of leadership, which we have here at UBC, um, and, and it's, it's actually at quite a few levels. We talked about what's happening in the Faculty of Science, uh, and I've talked to all the deans, and uh, they're really passionate. And, and what's, what's underway is, is really remarkable. And, and they're thinking about what they might do in the next couple of years, in the next five years. And I think it'll reveal uh, the um, sophistication and commitment uh, of, of leadership at, at different levels. And uh, I really believe that what Nine and showed will start to scale across the institution on both campuses. So, I'm actually excited about what's, what's happening here, to be very, very frank. Um, but I would say that uh, there are other mechanisms, and, and I'd say the provosts of the university and, and members of the executive are actually thinking about how to move the needle in terms of representation of faculty, staff, and students. Um, and there are vehicles that we can, we can, we can um, take advantage of right now. For example, uh, the academic leadership program. Uh, it's not very diverse. And we can start to ensure that it becomes diverse because it's really, as has been discussed, sort of the way we can start to encourage, as uh, uh, Francis said, uh, people who might not think about administration, to encourage them to identify people who are, are talented and uh, have skills, and there are many of them across this institution. So those are just a couple of, uh, of comments I wanted to make. It, it is, I really think we're poised for, for a remarkable achievement uh, with this effort. Thank you, Dr. Ono. So there are a couple of questions that relate to the, 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 the paradox, if you will. So one question relates to how do we address historic, systemic, and insidious underrepresentation of Black and Indigenous faculty and, 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 I was, and people of color generally and students when we do have decision makers insisting there is no problem, so the denial of racism, denial of systemic racism, and instead uh, choose to focus on, say, colorblind or color neutral idea of improving services for all. So how do we respond to this idea of uh, the, the need for the more nuanced approach that, for example, uh, Dr. Wright uh, pointed to? Mm -hmm. Well, um, since you named me, <laughs> you're probably calling me out. I might, I might need to say something about this. Um, I, I, I really do want to thank uh, Sarah Jane again for introducing me to this term inclusive excellence, because what people are looking at when they want to be colorblind, which is really a problem in and of itself, um, is to say what the argument usually is, we're looking for excellence. And the idea there is there's a double problem in that kind of notion. One is that we're making assumptions about uh, indigenous, about IB Park, people generally, that they are not as excellent. So we're starting from a premise of a deficit um, in how we're thinking about who it is that we're going to hire for certain positions. So that is in and of itself a problem. So if you begin to think of people as uh, equally excellent, equally qualified, then we might be starting from the same kind of standpoint. And what would make IB Park candidates maybe preferable is the idea of what kind of institution are we building? Think, instead of replicating uh, whiteness or replicating whoever's already there, who are people are most comfortable with, by adding that kind of diversity that people will bring, we will be adding to the richness of the culture. We'll be adding other perspectives. 
we'll be adding other ways of knowing. So there's all kinds of things, and that makes for, you know, inter, intra uh, uh, forms of awareness that are really um, uh, enabling for the, for the institution. And it just makes for a richer institution generally. And students coming into a room see a diverse set of folks who are uh, instructors and who are administrators. All of that makes a difference. So the argument then is to not just look for excellence in the traditional sense. And even then, we should be open to the idea that IBPOC could in fact be the most excellent candidate, but also to work more towards this idea of inclusive excellence. The inclusion in and of itself is another form of excellence and brings the kind of diversity and richness which we would want to see uh, in our institution replicated. So that's, that's one of the things that I would say that you, you probably need to do. Well, could I just add, uh, going back uh, to the original question of uh, the people who say they're colorblind. Now, that is a perfect example, of course, of unconscious bias. And how do we handle unconscious bias? Well, I guess the same way we handle anything, by education, by learning, by training, by uh, teaching them that when you say, well, I don't see color, I'm colorblind, uh, and, and go through the mechanics of analyzing their attitudes and their behaviors, and you find out very soon that they're not colorblind at all. In fact, they're biased. So uh, it's, it's the training and education and therapy perhaps required to uh, identify unconscious bias. So I guess we may have time for, uh, uh, Sarah Jane, I'll take a cue from you to uh, uh, one or two more questions. We can uh, do two more questions, Melinda. Okay. okay. So one question is, what might accountability look like at the institutional level, departmental level, and individual level? How do we mean accountability across all levels simultaneously? I'll go ahead and take a crack at that one, Melinda, if I may. Um, yeah. Because in the, the last year's process, we've spent quite a bit of time thinking about this in terms of recruitment. Uh, let's just take Indigenous faculty. Uh, as like Nainan says, it's, it's smaller numbers, so we can begin to digest it with the data that we have. So if we look at the Vancouver campus at the moment, we have round about 30 Indigenous faculty out of 6,282. So that is about point half of 1%. So the question is, um, what are the different mechanisms and accountability structures that can realistically improve those numbers? And I think I, I, I'm all for education and I'm all for encouraging uh, folks to take the uh, anti-bias workshops. I think all of that's helpful. I'm actually very skeptical that it's going to get us where we need to be in the long run and certainly not in the short run. I personally feel that there needs to be a system of uh, incentives and disincentives and put into place from the top down and rewards and um, punishments, honestly. And I think we've seen some familiar elements of this in the CRC's program recently of uh, until there is equity in, in the four groups uh, that there will not be further openings uh, for wider searches. I think that's a model that while it certainly has some limitations and we've seen those limitations play out uh, as that program has rolled out, certainly it sets a tone and it has turned people's attention to just how serious this is. So if we look at certain faculties that so far have no Indigenous faculty and we know they exist, uh, should they be incentivized to go find some or 
recruit some and, and rewarded for that. And I think on the unit level, what we often see is the fear of hiring uh, a more plural perspective is somehow going to cost them over the long run in the next line or two lines that come up. And so we have to change the calculation. We have to change the risk levels for each unit and each faculty that undergoes these decisions. So those are my two cents for the moment. Anyone else? So I, I will go ahead, Handel, go ahead. I, I just wanted to um, um, reiterate what, uh, what Cheryl's just brought up. Uh, in my work with um, the, the, the city of Vancouver, um, some of us in this um, uh, equity, external equity advisory, people were saying, well, you can have almost like a cynical view there'll be people who come to these workshops and these trainings, and now they can tick a box and say, I, I did anti-racism training, and then they can go back to their lives and live their lives as usual. And one of the things we kept saying is, there needs to be not just learning, but some way of saying something that comes out of that. And Cheryl, exactly what you said is where we arrived at. So we stopped talking about learning opportunities and talked and started to use the phrase accountable learning, which means if you're going to do these trainings, you're going to do these workshops, then you, there should be incentives and there should be disincentives for moving forward with some action based on what it is that you've learned in these workshops and in these learnings. And I think that's something that we can use here. I just chaired um, um, a higher, a higher um, in our, my own department where we were very reluctant. It was for an indigenous position. Um, we had two excellent candidates at two opposite ends of the spectrum. And we finally made the argument that yes, we want to hire one candidate, but it would be really problematic if we didn't have the opportunity to hire the second. We were very reluctant to make that argument because of what Cheryl is raising, which is to say, oh, if you had two indigenous people, maybe we won't get another hire for the next 10 years. Uh, luckily, it was actually approved you know, by our dean, but I'm not sure that that would be the, the case in many other circumstances. And I was chair of that that search committee, but it took a lot for, for me to write that letter to say, I am strongly recommending both of these candidates be hired and making that argument. Thank you. I think the final comment is going to be uh, Dr. Martani. Yeah, thank you, Melinda. I appreciate that very much. I think what Cheryl and Handel said is spot on. I just want to add my uh, complete support uh, behind what they said. But I'd also like just to add that recruitment is just one part of the puzzle from what I'm seeing in my role as senior advisor. I think we are doing, uh, we're making efforts to bring on board a lot of Black Indigenous scholars when we can, and I see people trying to do that. But we also need to focus on questions around retention and promotion. I think that's hugely important to me because I'm seeing a lot of people, a couple of people, I'm not, I mean, I think we need, the numbers really need to grow. I think I really need to stress that. But what is the warmth of the welcome when they get here? What are we doing to ensure that they have the support to thrive here? Because I don't want people to survive. I want them to thrive. Are we helping build a community in which they can see themselves here long term? Are there senior scholars of color here that they can turn to for support? I'm not convinced that we have enough uh, critical mass of people that can offer that kind of mentorship. And I'd really like to see that commitment happen in the next number of years. Okay, thank you. We have many, many questions and comments uh, in the chat box and the Q&A. Unfortunately, we are out of time at the moment. So I will turn the floor over. First, I would say, I wanna say a uh, uh, resounding thank you to uh, the speakers on this uh, panel. Obviously, we didn't have enough time. Each of you could have been a keynote all by yourself. We didn't have enough time to, to delve into all the themes, but there will be a opportunity afterwards. And I think Sarah Jane is gonna come on to share how that's going to work. Actually, I'm gonna pass it over to President Ono for his closing remarks and then okay. you're okay. Over, Melinda. Okay. Oh, I, I'm at the very end with the housekeeping. Okay. Yeah, well, First of all, I want to thank all of you for joining. Uh, I think over 180 people participated in this round table. And I have been reading many of the questions and comments that have come through. And I want you to know, all of you, that it means a great deal that you've all attended. And secondly, 
that we will endeavor to have spaces uh, where we can answer those questions and continue this dialogue because this is not a one-off um, uh, event. This is something that's going to take uh, years uh, to really uh, move the needle. And uh, I know from talking to many of you that you have great ideas and things already underway. So we'll be putting a spotlight on what's happening within the faculties and within the different vice presidential areas. Uh, um, and I'm really excited about what's going to happen in, in the year and the years ahead. So thank you for your commitment and for being part of this process. And we will have more opportunities for robust conversation. Thank you, Melinda, for accepting my invitation to come to this uh, university, for spending so much time over the past uh, month or so uh, thinking about these uh, presentations. Um, and uh, we've selected, I think, outstanding individuals that can really uh, highlight uh, the kinds of steps we can take uh, to really make UBC an even more uh, inclusive uh, and diverse institution where everyone can feel uh, a part of the institution and to be uh, welcomed into our community of scholars. I want to thank all the panelists who have contributed so much to expanding our understanding and knowledge of the ways that racism uh, can limit the potential of this great institution. Uh, and um, I know from talking to many of the deans and heads and directors that uh, many individuals are passionate, and as you could hear from what's happening in the Faculty of Science, uh, we know the steps that we have to take as an institution to really make this uh, a, a, a true university that really uh, benefits from, from the diverse uh, collection of individuals that we have at every level, and to, to do everything we can to to make it an even richer and invi inviting environment for, for, for everyone to thrive. So I wanna thank everyone for what they've done. And um, as I said, we'll be putting a spotlight on what's happening uh, throughout the institution and coming back to you uh, with um, ideas about how we can as an, an administration support uh, what's underway in each of the units and faculties. Before turning it over to Dr. Smith for the final word, I wanted to return to a quote from The Equity Myth. In the final chapter, the authors write that silence about race and racial issues remains the norm. It does nothing to address the reality that race and racism have shaped and continue to shape the experiences, opportunities, and perceptions of indigenous and racialized individuals as professors and scholars. It's my hope that with this dialogue, the dialogues that have occurred earlier this week and uh, tomorrow with the Board of Governors and our sustained dialogue as a, as, a, as a leadership team that we will begin to address those experiences that, as I said, were shocking and, and sobering and heartbreaking that I've heard over the past several months of speaking to uh, BIPOC faculty, staff, and students on both campuses. Let's do this. Let's address this and, and, and make sure that we become the inclusive institution that we have committed to be. Today is a great start to that. Thank you very much for being part of, of today. Thank you. Um, so before we close, I, I turn the floor to Sarah Janet. So I want to say a few, just a few comments um, uh, to reiterate some of the things I've said. One the, at the heart of this uh, conversation is how do we move beyond generic notions of diversity or, or employment equity or diver equity, diversity, inclusion to think more about racial equity and racial justice? How do we, um, racism, it's, it's about understanding racism, all the nuances that, was, that were outlined in um, the keynotes, the talks by Dr. Henry and Dr. Wright, all the nuances laid out from the personal to systemic and Dr. Matani's talk, all the strategies laid out and, and all the statements and, and, and feedback laid out in um, Dr. Lightfoot's talk and all the ways in which racial inequity plays out as highlighted by the careful attention to data collection for each equity group and at the intersections as laid out by Dr. Abraham. Racism justifies inequality. It excuses inequality 
it locates inequality in, in the deficit thinking of racialized minorities. That's the primary purpose of racism. And part of unsettling racism, the urgent and pragmatic guide uh, for institutional leaders to establish racial equity and an anti-racist policy. That was one of the questions posed that we didn't get to. Can UBC develop an anti-racism policy similar to what's at the University of Manitoba, for example? That's probably true for all Canadian universities, including my own. The challenge is not just for universities to figure out what needs to be done, though, to advance racial equity and racial justice. Rather, are our colleagues at UBC willing to do it? We know that President Santa Ono is doing it, and I will take from the presence of all of you here attending that you are keen to learn how to do it. So the awareness, so the first part is your awareness. You un, and that's obviously underway. But it's also figuring out the root causes of racial inequities. And what we see in here is that that discussion has to be nuanced. It cannot be one size fits all. And it cannot be based on this notion that racial equity, increasing racial equity uh, decreases excellence. It's not an either or. Rather, we need to, as Dr. Wright pointed out, think about inclusive excellence. So it's not enough to just talk about it. It's, we need to actually develop a strategy. And that means treating about how to treat racialized people equity, equitably, and that equitable treatment entails treating equity deserving racialized people differently. So should a racial equity strategy um, to effect change move from talking about it? That means shifting the dominant narratives that undermine racial justice, the dominant narrative that, got, that was uh, submitted to the feedback on the indigenous strategy, for example. It means research and evidence-based policymaking. You need the data, such as Dr. Uh, uh, Nainan pointed out, and the data, both quantitative and qualitative, that uh, Dr. Francis Henry pointed out. You need institutional capacity. So what does it mean to say you want to achieve racial equity if you don't look at the infrastructure, not just the equity, diversity, inclusion infrastructure, but the anti-racism structure to do that? So what, what exists to deal with, say, for racial harassment, racial discrimination, racialized bullying? Not just policy in the paper, but the mechanism to get redress and fairness. So it means building leadership capacity. There are a number of questions about that. Why is the, and that means looking at who gets appointed to directors, associate chairs, chairs, associate deans, deans, associate vice presidents, and, pres and vice presidents, all the way up that, that uh, uh, pipeline and pathways. Who gets tapped? Who gets, who gets um, mentored? Who gets sponsored? And to say among leaders, no, we want a more diverse pool. We want diverse leadership, show us the result and have accountability mechanisms for that. That also means uh, leadership development and training. Finally, a good race equity strategy requires that it's necessary for institutional change, but it must be able to be operationalized and it must include a means to monitor and reverse any uh, 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 inequities that persist. So I think I want to thank Dr. Uh, uh, ono for his, uh, um, his, his vision, his commitment, but also going beyond words to insisting on practice. That's exemplary. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's trailblazing in Canada. And so uh, I, I'm, I've been, it's been my privilege to be a part of it. So I want to thank you all for attending. And I now turn the floor over to Sarah Jane. Thank you very much, um, uh, Melinda. And uh, uh, I'd like to echo some of those thank yous. Um, in particular, uh, President Ono for um, uh, really uh, becoming a leader in terms of the, the commitments you've made around anti-racism and following through on it in um, such demonstrable ways. Um, 
uh, Francis Handel and, and Nainen, um, I learn something every time I, I listen to you. Um, it's always uh, uh, such a, a wonderful experience. And, and I love how you've challenged us to think about um, the ways in which we can do this work here at UBC. And then um, to uh, Melinda Manel and Cheryl, who um, have been really my guides in, in, in helping to, to set these events up. Um, I uh, can't tell you how much I appreciate um, all of your um, brilliant thinking and um, organizing and um, assistance in, in making this all happen. So, so thank you um, so very much. Uh, we're now at the end of the session, and I'd like to thank you all for coming as well. Um, I invite you at this time to join us um, for the breakout discussion, which is happening at 6.15 today. So you get a little bit of a break, um, but really I encourage you to come back um, so that we can focus on some ways to take the learning and discussions that we've had um, here today and turn them into action. Uh, you'll find that the link is available in your calendar invite, so there um, was no need to register, and uh, everyone is welcome. So I look forward to seeing you all there um, on the other side. Uh, and if you require a link for the breakout session, um, please contact uh, hr.admin at ubc.ca. Once again, thank you all very much for joining us and I'll look forward to seeing you in 15 minutes. Thanks.